Hello, welcome everybody. Um, it's a great pleasure to welcome you to the fantastic event we're going to have this evening, the Miners' Strike 40 Years On. Um, my name is Mary Stewart and I'm the lead curator of oral history here at the library and the director of the oral history charity based here, National Life Stories. I'm particularly excited to be here because the book that I hope you've all read and had a, I've got a copy of um, by Robert Gorday um, is based on over 150 interviews across um, the UK and the oral history team at the library is delighted that all of those interviews are archived here at the library for public access. Um, at the moment, most of you will know that we are suffering the after effects of a cyber attack. Um, and so the interviews will be available as soon as um, we're able to restore our listening and viewing service on site. Um, colleagues are working hard to make that happen. Um, please keep up to date with that on the British Library's Sound and Vision blog. And then you'll be able to come in and listen to the recordings and experience all of the rich um, orality of the interviews, as well as reading the excerpts um, that Robert's book is based on. Um, we'd like to extend a very special welcome to those of you joining us online, um, and we hope you, that you enjoy this evening. Um, a few bits of housekeeping so we can all have a really interesting event and some great questions and answers later. Um, we'll be taking questions from people both online and um, in-house. If you're watching online, you need to submit your questions from using the question um, box below the video. And for our audience in the theatre, please raise your hand and we have some roving microphones that will come to you to make sure that everyone can hear your question. A bit more on housekeeping. Um, if you are um, sitting in this great um, auditorium, please switch off your mobile phone or make sure it's on silent. Um, and we're not expecting any fire alarms. So if there is some kind of loud fire alarm sound, it's real and we will all politely and um, very calmly leave um, the building following all the emergency exit signs. Um, but without further ado, you're not here to listen to me, you're here to listen to our great speakers on the stage. Um, it's my pleasure to introduce our chair for tonight, which is David Hendy, who's the first person here on my left. Um, David is a writer and broadcaster and emeritus professor of media and cultural history at the University of Sussex. Um, he's worked also as a current affairs producer at the BBC um, in the late 1980s and early 1990s and covered a range of domestic and international affairs, so very relevant to this, e this evening. And he's written and presented many series for Radio 4 and Radio 3, um, including Noise, A Human History and The Essay. And his latest book is A History of the BBC, The BBC, A People's History. So without further ado, over to you, David. Thank you. Thank you. <coughs> Thank you, Mary. Um, so, uh, just to explain the format uh, that we're going to take, I'm going to be talking with the panel of four speakers for the next 50, 55 minutes or so, uh, and then you'll get a chance to ask some questions. Uh, and if you see me at that stage glancing down to this iPad, that's because I'm looking at some of the questions that might come in online. We have to finish the whole thing bang on 8.30, so with apologies in advance, I'm under, under orders to be very strict with everyone about time. So let me begin straight away by introducing uh, the panellists. First of all, uh, Robert Gilday is Professor Emeritus of Modern History at the University of Oxford and an award-winning author of several highly regarded books about, among other things, France after the Revolution, the German occupation of France during the Second World War, the French resistance, and the turmoil of 1968. In his book on the French resistance, Fighters in the Shadows, Robert wrote that only first-person accounts can lay bare individual subjectivity, the experience of resistance activity, and the meaning that resistors later gave to their actions. He's been interested in using oral history for more than a quarter of a century, and his latest book, Backbone of the Nation, Mining Communities and the Great Strike of 1984 to 85, published by Yale University Press, is the latest incarnation of his approach. Based on 148 interviews, it offers us a completely new take on this extraordinary moment in British history. It is a work of rigor, but as the reviewers have pointed out, it's also infused with humanity and compassion. So you're not allowed to leave this building without buying a copy. Uh, Francis O'Grady, uh, I should say Baroness O'Grady, 
uh, now sits on the Labour benches in the House of Lords, but between 2013 and 2023, she was the General Secretary of the TUC. Francis said this, you have an obligation never to forget your roots. Hanging in her, in her office at the TUC, she had a painting by Tom McGuinness of miners outside Merton Colliery in County Durham. Her roots were firmly in the trades union movement. Her grandfather, a founding member of the Transport and General Workers Union in Ireland. Her father, a shop steward at the Cowley car plant in Oxford. She can give us the view from the very top of the trades union movement. She's also been a determined grassroots campaigner for workers' rights over many years. And she currently leads the TUC campaign to save the NHS. Sean James uh, was at the very heart of the support networks that sprang up in South Wales during the miners' strike. Networks that raised funds, fed thousands of mining families, and forged alliances with groups such as lesbians and gays support the miners. She was portrayed memorably by Jessica Gunning in the 2014 film Pride. The film's writer, Stephen Beresford, described Sean as, I quote, a powerhouse, a highly intelligent working class woman, an engine of social action. The end credits for that film remind us that after the strike, Sean returned to education, studying for a degree at Swansea University, and that in 2005, she was elected as Labour MP for Swansea East, serving the constituency in Parliament for the next 10 years. She's also worked in a range of organisations, both public and private, including as director of Welsh Women's Aid. And finally, John Harris started his journalistic career in music criticism and still writes about popular culture and music. His social reportage, which appears regularly in The Guardian, deals with questions about the post-industrial condition, the politics of the labour movement, and Britain's regional and national inequalities. His video series, The Guardian, Anywhere But Westminster, has vividly captured the mosaic of political feelings of people around Britain. And in 2021, it won the Orwell Prize for political journalism. The panel. <coughs> so I wanted to start with some kind of assessment from each of you in turn about the significance of the strike, which is a kind of huge topic. But let me just start off with you, Robert. Your most celebrated books have mostly been about really epic moments in European history, particularly French history, moments of huge political upheaval. You're, I think, probably one of the very few people in this room who could point out, as you do in the book, that... 18th of June 1984, the date of the Battle of Orgreave, was also the anniversary of the Battle of Waterloo. On that day, you wrote, the miners were the French and Scargill a beaten Napoleon. <laughs> so, so when we're talking about the extraordinary 12 months of the strike, should we think of it in those sort of epic historical terms, on a kind of footing with the kind of events you've studied in the past? Well, thank you for that question. It's, it's a bit of a fast ball. But um, <laughs> as it happens, the idea for this book came, from, came to me on the day Mrs Thatcher died. And everyone was uh, coming onto the radio saying what a wonderful woman she was. The only people who said she was a so-and-so were the miners. And at that point, I was writing a book, the book you referred to on the French resistance. So I did think about what would resistance be like in Britain? What would a resistance movement look like in Britain? And I did think, well, I thought then, well, maybe the miners' strike was an act of resistance. But when you start to make parallels, you think, well, who were the Germans and who was the Vichy regime? <laughs> well, although we were not, you know, apart from the Isle of Man or the um, Channel Islands, you know, Britain was obviously not occupied by the Germans, but in a way... Your mining communities were occupied by the police, and in particular the Metropolitan Police that was sent out to police far and wide, um, in particular from the summer of 1984, when there was huge pressure from the government and the National Cobalt to get miners back to work, and literally uh, pit villages, mining villages, were occupied by the police in order to put pressure 
on miners to return to work, not only to, to, to protect the miners who wanted to return to work and also to, um, uh, to penalise, to arrest those who uh, were trying to stop the return to work. In terms of the Vichy regime, is the Thatcher regime a Vichy regime? Well, um, some of the language that Mrs Thatcher used about the miners' strike when she talked about uh, the enemy within and when she talked about mob rule does actually recall the language of the Vichy regime when it talked of terrorists, uh, talked of resistors as terrorists and bandits. This, this attempt to sort of exclude and outlaw and delegitimate any, any, any resistance movements. Obviously in France, there was the, the, France was divided between resistors and collaborators. Now, I mean, I don't know whether there's anyone from Nottinghamshire here, but you could see that the, uh, the, the, the working miners of Nottinghamshire might be seen as collaborators with, with the regime. After all, Mrs. Thatcher sent a note of congratulations to them, you know, I think September, saying thank you so much for um, defending democracy and going to work. Um, and obviously, you know, the, the miners can be seen of, uh, as, as being part of the resistance movement. Just two more little points. One is, uh, the, you know, there was a huge amount of violence uh, in occupied France, and um, especially towards the end, after D-Day, when people came out of the woodwork, the Mackie came out of the woodwork, uh, and, and, and were resisting the Germans and the Vichy regime. But, I mean, in a way, that kind of civil war and that sort of violence was, was present in Britain from day one when uh, uh, flying pickets were going over the borders into Nottinghamshire to try to get them, those, those miners to, to come out on strike. So, in a sense, that kind of violence, which, and, and again, the Battle of Orgreave that you referred to, um, you know, looks a bit like a, an encounter um, between... Um, you know, the, the forces of order and, and, and the resistance. But one last thing is just about the role of women. Because women were key to the French resistance. As, as in so many of these movements, you know, women aren't necessarily the front line, but they are, you know, they are supporting. They, are, they were the liaison agents. They were the people who were uh, hiding uh, people who were trying to escape, hiding Jews, hiding Allied uh, pilots. And again, the... the you, you referred to um, Shan's role in the, in, 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 in the support groups. The support groups that sprang up up and down the country in mining communities, which were, which were raising money uh, for, uh, for soup kitchens, for um, food parcels, the, the, these, these, were li these literally sustained uh, the strike for over a year, for a year. And, 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 and it's people like Shan working in those support groups that really made the difference. And one of the points that you, you make at, towards the beginning of the book is this is, you say, it's not just about a strike about, about money. It's much more about, to quote you, much more about sympathy and solidarity on a grand scale. So, I mean, you're alluding to the fact that this is, that this is a, an emotional history as well. There's a, there's a lot of feelings involved in writing about the miners' strike. Well, there are a lot of feelings. And, and, as, and, and I wanted I wanted to put front and centre the idea of community. I didn't just want to write about picket lines and, 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 and battles. The, the, the defence, because there was this, I think, that I'm not sure, I'm not, I think this phrase came from South Wales, close a pit, kill a community. And, uh, and, and the people you know, involved in the strike action and the support groups knew that if, if, if the strike was lost and the pits closed, jobs would go. And then schools would go, and post offices, and leisure facilities, and, and, and those mining communities would be left desolate, which is, of course, what happened. So, yes, it's very emotional. Thank you. Francis, um, I mean, I'm going to jump now right to the end of the strike. Uh, so, a year later, March 1985, and that sort of return to work, which we can probably recall seeing that kind of news footage, and there was an attempt at kind of, you know, dignity, you know, returning with heads held high back to the collieries with banners and sometimes with music. But it was a defeat. Um, I mean, it was a defeat for the miners. It was a defeat for the NUM and presumably for the trade union movement as a whole. Um, so, I mean, I mean, your brother, I think, was a miner. So I wondered whether that was what it felt like to you and your family at the time. You, you were involved deeply in the trades union movement. 
uh, in your family. Did it? Did it? Did that wider sense of defeat resonate? Without doubt. Um, so my brother uh, was a miner on strike in South Derbyshire, where only eventually a very small minority uh, stayed on strike. But the area had voted uh, to work as well. So, you know, there were issues here about competing democracies, if you like, between the national and areas. But my brother was on strike. Um, he was a young miner at the time. He'd gone up there because I've got lots of sisters. The sister was in Burton-on-Trent and could put him up till he found his feet. Um, and, uh, and actually, I've got kind of big memories of that. We often talk about women who, by the way, I see as leaders, not just supporters. Um, but I also kind of vividly remember I'd done a part-time trade union course at Middlesex Poly um, in a few years before. And one of those coincidences is that uh, Middlesex ended up twinned with the area where my brother was on strike. So I also vividly remember kind of going down to the meeting he was going to address with um, his wife. And it was packed and standing room only. And it was hugely emotional um, seeing him speak. Uh, it wasn't just women who found their voice. A lot of working class men found their voice. Uh, but I think we probably knew... My own personal view is the longer strikes go on, the harder they are to settle, partly because they become about much more than the original dispute. And this had become this epic struggle between one of our strongest trade unions and a state, and a, well, a, and a, a government that was intent on a new model of unregulated capitalism which necessitated trade unions being put in their place and broken, um, and a state that deployed, you know, all greed, we remember, but let's also remember that a lot of the police forces had practised their skills in Brixton, Moss Side, Belfast and Derry. Um, you know, so this wasn't a kind of new experience, and certainly in terms of my family heritage, there was an awareness that the sort of state violence we were seeing uh, was not unfamiliar. Um, but for the movement, for sure, because, uh, you know, maybe we'll get on to this, but um, there were issues about the ballot. There were issues uh, about whether there was a clear negotiating objective. Uh, you know, sometimes in trade union life, it's not all um, absolute victories. Sometimes it's about being clear about what your bottom lines are and uh, being a bit light on your feet. Uh, was that possible at that stage, given the intent of Thatcher's government? That's, you know, something maybe we'll discuss. But it, for me, it sort of heralded this real shift. It wasn't, it wasn't the beginning, but it was the most vivid illustration of an intent to break a trade union movement, the only institutions that working people have ultimately to defend themselves against the worst excesses of capitalism. And there was an intent to smash that. And so, uh, you know, seeing those images of miners marching back with bands and banners is very, very kind of poignant. Um, but I mean, if maybe just, I know we'll get on to this later, but just to say, my last year as General Secretary at the TUC, the official figures show uh, that the number of days lost through strike action were back up to, matched those lost in 89. Uh, you know, that was the record is highest figure since 89. Now, strikes aren't the only measure of the strength of organisation, but it's a bit of an indication there's life in the old dog yet. Yeah. <laughs> uh, good. <laughs> um, <laughs> Sean, um, at the very start of the strike, you describe yourself, your words, as a Welsh man. Yes. 
a very happily married wife and mother, a typical Valley's wife, you said. But you also said, I can honestly say my war was a good war. It changed my life. So I wonder whether perhaps you can just tell us a little bit about that, that personal transformation, but also how that became something broader, because you know, it can be a, mining communities can be fairly socially conservative uh, communities. And you said, another quote from you, for the first time, people were interested in what women had to say, and not just women, working class women. And there, there was a, a, a bigger political wake, awakening that you, you've, you've talked about, wasn't there? A sort of sense of finding common cause with, with other groups um, at the time. As a great granddaughter and a granddaughter of miners and mining stock and real, railway men, you know, I knew what a trade union was about. We had, three, we had three things in our community that sustained us. That was socialism, the Labour Party and the trade union. And the three were very intertwined. And what encapsulated all of this, and I think working class communities understand this perfectly, is there is one sacrosanct rule. Never mind ballots, never mind, you know, mandates. You do not cross a picket line. Yeah. That was it. You do not cross a picket line. So my husband said to me when he came home that first day, picketed out, because we in South Wales had voted. We were devastated by that vote. We had taken very, very bitter pills in the, in the not too distant past, before 84, six collieries in the South Wales region, in the west, in the anthracite coalfield, nary a whimper. Nobody prepared to come out and stand with South Wales when those pits went. Pits that employed men, employed women in certain roles. Pits that sustained communities. That's where the money was made. For every one job in a colliery, you had four jobs outside of the colliery. So we understand, or we understood, how important that entity was. I knew nothing about that entity. I'd visited my father's colliery, Abba Pergum, and had been put on the loco, uh, that's the, the train, in an adit, uh, to go and have a, a little ride when I was about 10 into the adit, totally legally, of course, and, you know, uh, but this is what people did. I, and I saw this box in the corner, and I said to my dad, it's in a box, Dad. And my father said, oh, for good then, Bauer. It's a rat trap. That was it. I was off that, you know, <laughs> I was off that logo and I was back up, you know. Didn't get very far in, about 80 foot. But it was a very closed world to us. It was extremely close to us as women. And the, the, the important thing, the decision-making entity, was the lodge. The lodge and the union, and in that we trusted. So I, you know, here we are, young family, quite happy. We'd already bitten into the bone. We've talked about the mandate, the votes, the ballot. There had been a mandate and a vote on whether we would take industrial action. Uh, maybe you think that Al Skagel had been a bit clever, but he got that permission, he got that mandate. If ever he could prove that there were collieries under attack and the government said it was all lies, and he was making it all up. The 30-year rule proved him right. It was there in black and white. They had a plan. They were going to close collieries, and we could not imagine what was going to come next. We'd had a government for five years that didn't particularly have any interest in us and our communities. You know, uh, I had cousins who were on the dreaded YTS. Does anybody remember the YTS? <laughs> Youth Training Scheme. Well, I'm not too sure what they got trained in doing, but building a brick wall, which they knocked down at the end of it. Very handy if they were going to build a retaining wall in the gardens or a nice rockery. But they didn't get a certificate. They didn't get any work experience. It was all, you know, very much pie in the sky. Then I remember reading a very well-known features writer in the Western Mail, Mario Bassini. Uh, and he's very, again, mining family, Italian mining family, uh, you know, come over with the Italian wave people to work in the valleys. And Mario Bassini being very sarcastic in an article about, before long, we'll get excited when they open a ice cream factory on top of 
you know, a mountain in Wales, and it'll have 12 jobs. That's how, you know, people were fating and lauding jobs, you know, and they weren't major job employers, they weren't big opportunities, and they certainly didn't seem to us as if they could ever replace the, 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 the employment power of collieries. But I can add into that the dock workers. I can add into that the rail workers. I can add into that BP Llandarcy and BP Baglan Bay. Every boy I was in school with walked out of school in 1975, 74, 75, with an apprenticeship. And they relied on that apprenticeship, whether it was in the local colliery, whether it was in BP, they got it. So there was an assumption that these jobs would be there forever to cradle us and look after us. And remember, we were right at the beginning of the debate about the environment and our awareness of what fossil fuels were doing very, very early on in that debate. So we couldn't work out what was going to come next. And that was the big question. You know, what is going to happen next? What will come and replace these jobs? What security will my children have and their children have if these jobs... All right, maybe people in other parts of the country wouldn't understand what the attraction of going... But it was a job with dignity, it had a good wage, and it had a future at that time. My dad actually said to my husband, <laughs> I said, Martin, go and work underground. We will always need coal in Britain. <laughs> yeah, Dad? And remember, remember, after the Second World War, our biggest export was coal. It's not me saying it, that's the facts and figures. We needed that coal to export to get money on foreign currency and get our economy going again. In 1961, we were 90% dependent on coal for all of our energy needs. It's mind-boggling, isn't it? And there, politicians were telling me, don't worry about that, because we can have, we can be like France, fast breeder reactors. What? You know, I, oh, I'm a bit worried about this, like, you know. <laughs> and you've got all this debate going on, and we didn't know what was going to come next. So as women, as wives, as mothers, as sisters, aunties, grannies, we were talking about these things, but the decision-making processes really were beyond us. So a few, few days into the strike, down I go, down to the local town of Estragon Mice. And uh, that's where I grew up, where I know everybody. I still go to regularly. I've got a wonderful miners' welfare hall there. Great. And I walk into the local Italian coffee, Cafe, Santis, and all the old boys are there. You know, the ones who were wrapped in the red flag, can sing the Internationale, and fought in the Civ Spanish Civil War. Right? Because they were gods in our community. They were gods. You know, they had fought in Spain. They had been in the International Brig Brigade. You know, real heroes for us. And I remember one of them saying, not they're not all. They hadn't all fought there, but you know, they, yeah, you know, and they had nicknames like Jim Stalin and you, you know things like this. And I used to sit there quietly in the corner with my with, with my with my cup of hot red vina, you know, listening to them talk. And they said, "Don't worry, the NUM will see Maggie off in a matter of weeks." And I remember thinking, "Well, are we going to do that then? You know how?" Why is it up to us? Why is it that the NUM were seen as the stormtroopers of the trade union movement? Well, one, they had discipline. Two, they had this belief, you know, and nothing. Even now, uh, all, all of my friends, and we were very proud of this on the weekend in Durham, 52 weekers. Our husbands were 52 weekers. That meant that you made 52 weeks that you were on strike for 52 weeks. In the pecking order, that's the top. You know, you know there was none of this, we may go back, or we want to go back. Yeah, there were moments where you thought, oh, dear, where's the money going to come from? Oh, I've got to go down the bank and tell the bank manager again. And fortunately, our bank manager, uh, his dad was on strike, his brothers were on strike. <laughs> so you'd go in, not my husband, I hasten to add. 
and you'd go in and go, hey, how you kept, you know, yeah. How's it going in Shangwa? You know, no, no end in sight, you know. Any chance of you paying off any of this overdraft? <laughs> Yeah? And then he'd sort of, we'd have a little chat, ask how his mother was, ask how his brothers were doing, then he'd say, right, I'm extending it by another £50. He'd say, yes, yes, I've achieved what I want to achieve, you know. We've got a little bit more money and a little bit more leeway to go. But the alternative welfare state we created is what I'm proudest of. Because pretty soon we realised that we had to start, if this was going to be a long strike, and all the signs were there, how were we going to sustain it? And Howell Francis, Professor Howell Francis, always, and Howell served as a member of, you know, his parliament when I <coughs> arrived. He was chairman of our support group. Howell used to say, it's cheap at half the price for a bag full of food, isn't it? If we can help people remain staunch, remain solid. And we pretty well did. And it wasn't until the November of the strike in South Wales that we started to see a trickle. You know, a man here, a few men there. Uh, and personally, I apologise to her, if you know her, I hate Jan Lee Ming. I hate Jan Lee Ming. I think she's I in the audience here. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, Mrs. Lee Ming, Mrs. Lee Ming. But she'd come on every night, you know, beautifully dressed, and she'd go, and today, British Cole announced that there are 47 pits. You know, 50 cent fits, 60 cent fits working. And he, you feel like throwing things at the TV. You know, you think, that's a lie. They can't be working. You can't produce coal with half a dozen men, which has previously employed 800 men. The economics don't add up, do they? You can't keep the safety standards up. You can't keep the production up. So all of this was, was pretty, you know, all in the mists. And we as women realised that we had the set of skills. We had these organisational skills, which we had learned through being mothers, being activists in the Labour Party, uh, the trade union backgrounds we were from. You know, we knew that we had these skills. Uh, and gradually, the men just sort of stood back and said, oh, let them get on with it. They know what they're doing. They're doing a brilliant job. And we even were organising picketing, rotors, everything. But... The main thing was that these skills were such transferable skills and we hadn't really considered that at all. We, we hadn't been expected. And then round about that period when Margaret Thatcher started calling us the enemy within. Do you know, every time it got tougher, we had to work harder. Every time more was demanded of us, we just stepped up and we did more. And if we had to do more, that's what the price was, just to keep us going. And I know it's very difficult for people to understand. And I think that was something we had to talk to you about, Robert, again, was just a little bit more. If you talk to people, we all believe that we could have just done a little bit more. Whether it's true or not, I can't say, but we could have done more. I know personally as a family and as, as individuals, if we needed to do more, if we needed to go without more, we would have done it. Because we had this network in our support group where we invited people who supported us to come and see what they were supporting and to see where their money was being spent. You know, people like LGSM were coming to visit us and actually living with us. And um, Many people should, tell me... I should say, Sean, just for those who might not know LGSM, uh, lesbians and gays support the minors. Yeah. yeah. And, and the whole thing was, we were learning so much about their <laughs> lives, the Southern Black Sisters. I remember being absolutely gobsmacked by the Southern Black Sisters. They asked me along to a meeting, and I thought, these wonderful women, my gosh, look, look, look what they're achieving, look at what they've faced, look at the, 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 the battle they've had. It's not just our battle, it's their battle, all of our battles. And what we learned was that the story of all the women in the strike is my story isn't very different to any other woman's. We were there, we stepped up to the plate, we did the most amazing things, and we learned the most, you know, amazing skills, and that's never gone away. We're still there. 
Mm. We're still in the communities. And whether it's people who went into politics or whether it was people who became active in their trade unions or whether they became active as par you know, parents in their local <coughs> PTAs, they had these skills. And I, I'm very proud to say that the, the, the most important skill we passed on to our children was not to accept things as they are to question and to query and to think about what sort of human being you were. You know, it's a question, what did you do in the war, Daddy? What did you do in the strike? It really is, you know, Mum, you know, what did you do? Why did you feel like that? Mm. But nobody in my community felt that anything was too much or too little or that we couldn't raise the bar every time. And that was the difficult thing, was when you just felt... We're getting somewhere. The bar had to be raised again. Great. Thank you, Sean. Uh, John, I, want, I mean, that's a, a really striking image of solidarity and determination. But, I mean, you, you know from the so social reportage that you do for The Guardian that it's actually very difficult to kind of capture very often a singular sense of, say, what the public mood is or the public response to a particular situation. Yeah. So I wonder, when you read... Robert's book, um, you know, based on 148 different interviews. Yeah. I mean, did you feel that it was possible that this is something that can only be told from multiple perspectives? You know, different coal fields have different moods, different responses, yeah, it, different stories. Or, I mean, is it possible to find a single overarching story that stands out? Well, I think both things are true. So, although I've enjoyed watching uh, on television recently those three Channel 4 films and the one film that was on BBC Two, I think, uh, it's nice that Sean's here and I'll talk a bit about South Wales and my connections to it in a moment. What I thought was lacking in those programmes was exactly that range of voices and experiences. And, and the danger with the way that they did it was sight unseen. If you knew, knew nothing about the Magnus Strike, you'd think it was something that pretty much exclusively happened in South Yorkshire and Nottinghamshire. And as important as those stories are, voices get missed out. And that's why I think Robert's book is, is, is so valuable as a, as a sort of document of the strike. Um, but running through all those stories, uh, you, you, there, is a, there is a common story, a common narrative thread which is huge, just goes back to your question to Robert about, about you know, without getting sort of wanting to over-romanticise it too much, uh, that seem epic, because they're about huge historic change. And I was keenly aware of that at the time. Um, I was 14 when the strike began, I was 15 when it ended, and uh, I have this deep familial connection with the South Wales coalfield on my father's side of the family. My grandfather uh, was a coal miner uh, in Bedworth near Caerphilly, he was a union official. This is a long time before the strike. Um, but that's, that's who he was. And um, it's not unique to South Wales, but it's very pronounced in South Wales. People here will know this, that, that in the coal fields, there was this very deep ethic of, I don't know what you call it really, collective advance, collective betterment, the importance of education. It was all there in the Workers' Education Association, the miners' welfare, and so on. And my dad's family really embodied that. My grandfather was a coal miner who would sit in the corner and he would, he would, you know, you'd have a conversation about something quite banal and suddenly a quote from Oliver Cromwell would come out or he'd start to, he would start talking about uh, the Peasants' Revolt. And this was all from the WEA, from the Workers' Education Association. And this idea of collective advance and collective self-betterment, if, if, you, if you want to really boil down Margaret Thatcher's complete failure really, to understand the coal fields and how they work. That was exactly the gap in understanding. That her, her notion of betterment was about individual pushiness, you know, being thrust in and go-getting and yuppies and ambition and all of that stuff. And uh, the kind of idea of aspiration, is a very modern word, that was there in the coal fields and in the South Welsh coal fields in particular was very, very different. And my father lived that out. He became... A university lecturer, he was a nuclear engineer. Uh, and the reason, actually, he, he went to work at Windscale Works in the 50s was because he wanted to liberate the world from coal. He, he came from a place where, as he, he always puts it, he's still alive, where the rivers ran black. He had a very ambivalent relationship with coal, but at the same time, he understood that he was there precisely because of this culture of education and so on that had been there in the coal fields. 
So he was a university lecturer and his two siblings both became school teachers. It's very interesting that that sort of aspiration very often led, led into public sector jobs rather than private sector jobs. And my family sort of lived that. So when the strike came around the corner, uh, I had this constant sort of big picture narration from my dad who knew exactly what was at stake. And a lot of what was at stake, the focus of the strike, of, of course, was about uh, the pits and the communities that surrounded them, but they blurred out into even bigger questions about this very, very different vision of society and what uh, progress was, uh, the value of education, all of these things. This profoundly collectivist idea, which in my family's estimation, quite rightly, I think, they'd seen as being really enshrined in the 45 to 51 Labour government. And Aaron Bevan really is the absolute embodiment of this story. Uh, and that Thatcher was, was wanted to destroy all this. And uh, that the NUM was the sort of last bulwark against the destruction of all this stuff. I remember clearly conversations that my dad would have with my auntie who was involved, who lived in um, Pontypridd at the bottom of the Ronda Valleys, who was involved in um, Women Against Pit Closures, and they would talk in those terms, you know. Uh, and it was entirely right that they did. That's precisely what was at stake. So it made the whole thing... Even sitting there in suburban Cheshire, watching this thing from afar, it made it all very visceral and vivid. That We had two cardboard boxes in the garage where I lived, uh, and they would fill up with food. And me and my brother were both on our teens. We were growing really quickly, and as we grew out of clothes, they would go in boxes, and when the boxes were full, they would go down to South Wales. We were both mods at the time. And there, was some very, there must have been some very well-dressed South Walian kids who would get jam shoes and things, as if anyone here knows what jam shoes are, black and white shoes, as me and my brother grew out of them. So this was a sort of a daily presence, right? Uh, and I remember vividly visiting South Wales a lot around this time. We'd go down, you know, once every six or seven weeks or whatever to visit relatives. And um, we were driving from Pontypri to Abergavenny, where my uncle lived, and there was a sort of, I remember this vividly, and there was a silence in the car, as you often get on car journeys. And my dad turned around to me, I was in the back, and he said, this is like a war, isn't it? Mm. I mean, that's, that's kind of how he felt it. And he was right. Uh, and unfortunately, <laughs> as has been said already, it was a war in which the side that I felt, me and my family, in our own somewhat indirect way, the side we were on, got beat, you know, and the images that you mentioned when you were talking to Francis earlier of the return to work, I watched them on, um, on all of those documentaries recently and I find them really sad, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, I well up watching those. And that, so all of that was there and I watched in the spectacle of those people going back to work that their struggle was over but also there were these huge other questions about what Thatcherism Unbound was going to look like and what this culture that my father and, and his siblings came out of, what was going to happen to that and that was the world in which, you know, we all emerged. My generation is completely steeped in all that. You know, they call us Thatcher's kids. And our relationship with that much more collectivist, gentle, solidaristic world is sort of at three or four times removed. I remember that world because I grew up in it. But I can't quite get back to it and touch it. And then the last thing I'll say is going back then to South Wales once the pit closure started was an extremely sobering experience for an outsider. It's a bit like when you, uh, when you see someone and then you don't see them for a while and they change, and whereas their friends and relatives who see them every day aren't aware of how much they've changed, you're suddenly struck by it. And what I remember, and this becomes even more vivid, vivid as the years go by, right up to now, the present day, right? Taft Street in Pontypridd, the main street, on Saturday mornings when I would go and visit my relatives, I would, we'd go out into the middle of Pontypridd, and I have never seen anywhere, this is before the strike, I have never seen anywhere so thriving and bustling in my life. It was so crowded. Like, who are all these people? And what are they doing? There were cafes, these bracky shops, Italian cafes, restaurants, a huge branch of Woolworths, the Lido, which is now the National Lido of Wales, I think it's called, it was always packed in the summertime. And the reason it was thriving and bustling was because miners were quite were reasonably well paid, right? So they were able, therefore, to have these thriving local economies. And going back there in the mid-90s, I cannot emphasise enough the sudden contrast between the town that I was confronted with then and the town that I'd known as a child maybe six or seven years before. And unfortunately, you, you go back to Pontypridd now, and it's nowhere is without hope, and there are people doing amazing community work there. And actually, you know, it's green now. There aren't slag heaps behind it and all that. It looks lovely. 
but it's lost its heart. There's a profound sense of loss about it, and it's very stark when you, when you, you confront it. And that, that, again, underlies the significance of the strike. That's when it was lost. I mean, there's a, there's a quote from you, which you, you wrote in The Guardian last year. You said, the miners' defeat began the era we're living in. Yeah. And I think this perhaps is a moment to turn our minds to, to actually dig into the legacy of the miners' strike a little bit, a little bit more. So I'd like to actually come back to you, Robert. And you actually spend a good quarter of your book tracing the sort of political <coughs> afterlife of the strike and the sort of afterlives of the strikers. And again, it's not a singular story. You've got, I noticed, one chapter called Ruin and another one called Redemption. So what was your sort of sense, really, of how you can tell the story of that legacy? Well, one of the, I mean, the, the technique I used in this book I mean, is familiar to all, all historians. It's called the life history interview. So you start off with the beginning of someone's life, and then you have the central part, which might be about 1968, or it might be about, in this case, the minor strike. And then, you, and then you ask them about what happened next, what happened to their family, what happened to their employment, what happened to their community, what happened to their politics. <clears throat> and so I had all these stories to try and make sense of, and I suppose I did group them under the, as you say, under, under the titles of Ruin and Redemption because, you know, we've heard from John about, you know, the devastation, the devastation of these mining communities. There's, you know, there's the unemployment, there's the fact that these proud, these proud men, uh, I'm thinking of one in particular, the South Wales miners, who at the beginning of his interview talked about the anthracite that he mined and he said it's like China. And he, and, and he was a skilled man. Then after the strike, he was flitting from factory job to factory job day by day. He was going down the job centre. He was going to the benefit office. He was being humiliated. He'd lost, you know, he'd lost his status. He'd lost his place in society. You know, and uh, I think he finished up voting Brexit. And, and I don't think he could vote for Mrs Thatcher because she was, you know, Mrs Thatcher. But I think he might have voted for the Brexit party, you know. So, you know, on the, uh, so on the one hand, there are the people whose, whose, whose lives were ruined, and you know, because I think it's been alluded to. I mean, there was, there was virtually no money in investment put into transition to other jobs, other economies. People were just left you know, to, to swing on their own, and, and they scrabbled around. You know, a lot of people like ex-miners, I, I, I mean, some of them finished OK. I mean, there's Watty down there, uh, who, you know, he's, he now drives... Railways, and, that, and, that's, and, that's, and that's a good job. I come across other Scottish miners who, who worked on the oil rigs for a bit and others who went into the steel industry in, in South Wales. But, um, but a lot of them were doing you know, very insecure, unpaid, well, uh, you know, poorly paid uh, jobs. A lot of them ended up working for the council, you know, working in the parks, you know, cleaning schools, clean, doing the bins. I mean, that's the kind of work they were doing. But, so that, that's, that's one story. But I remember you mentioned Howell, Howell Francis when I talked when I spoke to Howell Francis, who, who was a, a lecturer and uh, he was he was he ran out adult education in Swansea and, and and founded the South Wales Miners Library and incidentally did a lot of really interesting interviews just after the strike. He said to me when I met him once, he said, "Don't just tell stories about." about decline and destruction and, and despair. You know, there are other stories. That are, and, and his wife, uh, for example, Maya Francis, had, had founded, uh, found, after the strike, founded this, this outfit called Dove. And it was, it was basically a, 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 an organisation, a cooperative organisation to educate miners' wives who had... had uh, They'd all left school like the, the, the comrades at, at, at 15 or 16 max, and then they'd gone into other work or they'd raised a family, and they'd been politicised and made more articulate by the strike, and they wanted more learning. So there was this adult education facility that she <coughs> set up. And, and one of the things I discovered is that a lot of people um, from the strike, miners and miners' wives, went back into education went back to college, went back to university like Sean, and then they went into what I would call community-facing 
professions. They became social workers. They became probation workers. They did um, legal advocacy, uh, advocacy for people whose rights were being trampled on. They became care workers. I mean, in five, there's a whole bunch of people who, who may and ex-minors who went into the care sector, you know, working in old people's homes or children's hospices. And uh, what struck me about the, what was happening was that these people were trying to repair the communities that had been destroyed from a, on a high and, 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 and left to rot. And, um, and so the, I suppose the interesting thing is that they, 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 would, they would do it, they were, they were they're trying to repair the communities themselves by their own endeavours and by their community endeavours and using the solidarity and the skills that they'd learned. And I suppose one step up from that is the people who became local councillors. Many of these people became local councillors, and in the case of Sean and Howell, they became MPs. So I think, I think there's been an awful lot of um, work put into uh, reviving the communities or, or preserving the communities. Also, a lot of work into preserving heritage and talking about the heritage of the, mine, of the, of the mining industry. And, of course, commemoration. I mean, the thing is... Some of the pictures you're seeing, um, the, the, the black and white pictures you see there are, are taken by Ken Wilkinson, a Yorkshire miner who I think is somewhere in the audience. Um, the other ones, which were put in at short notice, were pictures I took of the um, Women Against Pit Closures reunion in Durham last weekend. Um, and these are the women who were involved in the strike from all over the country, all over three countries, who, have come to, who came together last Saturday to celebrate... Uh, their, their, their great achievements and, and to make contact. And, and one little woman you see when, when it comes back is there's a little, a little a, a woman who is actually an American woman miner called Kip Dawson, uh, who came over to support her comrades during the strike and now came back to celebrate the 40th anniversary. So there's a, there's a, I suppose my final point is that there's, you know, there was destruction, but there was revival, redemption, and, and, and the rebuilding of solidarity. I mean, that that rebuilding of solidarity is, I mean, something that kind of it, it raises a question of the trades union movement, doesn't it? Because, I mean, we were saying earlier, look, actually trade unions are, are pretty strong at the moment, right? But that 40-year journey has, has not been straightforward, and they might be strong in a slightly different way. I mean, there was something that felt distinctive, didn't it, about the NUM in the 1980s, that sense of Solidarity between workers who worked in the same place, but solidarity across generations and so on. Th that is different now, isn't it? I mean, work is more atomised. Well, exactly. Exactly. I mean, the world has changed, and they, uh, our opponents, shall we say, succeeded in so far as, uh, you know, look at the mushrooming of insecure contracts, zero hours, agency work look at the balkanisation of business where it's really hard often for workers even to know who ultimately employ them, never mind bargain and organise. Um, you know, so for sure. And of course that big shift from manufacturing to services and, you know, daughters no longer follow their mums into the same job, sons no longer follow their dads. So that kind of continuity presents different challenges when you're trying to build a movement that survives on solidarity. Um, but I think, I think a lot of lessons have been learned. I mean, in my kind of bleakest moments when I was thinking about this session, you know, there was a part of me that was saying, oh, my God, is the legacy of the miners' strike Lee Anderson? <laughs> you know, that, well, actually, I mean, yeah, I'm going to come to Lee you know, Anderson. But, 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 <laughs> but there, there's a kind of... Anyway, but on, on the positive side, certainly in my experience in terms of the leadership of unions and the TUC, many of us are of a generation where we understood that mass unemployment has, had been weaponised against us. Yeah, yeah. And we saw that as our kind of number one threat. And that's why, for example, during the pandemic, and the TUC and trade unions should take credit for this, our number one was getting a furlough scheme 
to make sure that they couldn't just get shot of workers yeah. and that money for business had to be channeled through workers' wage packets. That was quite, well, the first time ever in this country, uh, one of the best in Europe. You know, it was an achievement that, in my view, would not have happened without the trade union movement. But there's also been a lot of discussion amongst the leadership, inevitably because of what happened in terms of... Um, opportunistic employers in the private sector looking to uh, fire and rehire or hold wages down while they were opportunistically profiteering. And in the public sector, of course, you know, the general experience of working people having been hammered by the longer squeeze on living standards made us talk about amongst ourselves about uh, how that would be resisted and what lessons there were to learn and of course we have had what I see as kind of lawfare since the 1980s onwards you know certainly at one period it was every couple of years it felt like there was a new piece of anti-union legislation that was designed to make it harder for workers to organize and to stand up for ourselves so we again what I call the need to be light on our feet in many ways but even um you know, again, in my last year, as the strikes were, the strike wave, as I see it, was happening. Uh, you know, you'd get these fantastic moments where, um, you know, the rise of the disco picket line, you know, innovation, imagination, people finding new ways to do things. But actually, we had to run a program in the movement to remind people that picket lines weren't just about getting cars to. Um, bang their horns <laughs> you know the purpose was to peacefully persuade people not to cross fellow workers not to cross so building solidarity beyond was important and you know we had a whole program around that our winning public support was important and we, we you know we had a program around that too but in fact there was all this we had to go back to the beginning to get a whole new generation of workers uh, to understand how we could dance our way around some of the law, and um, but also you know the basics, persuading workers to stand together. So, um, you know, I'm I am an eternal optimist, but I think when you see the results of that solidarity, which had a material impact on people's pay packets, which, you know, in the end, trade unions have got to deliver on jobs and terms and conditions, that what we've seen is workers pushing back, also taking the opportunities where there are shortage occupations as well, not just to hold firm to, a, against real cuts to uh, paying conditions, but actually winning some gains as well. You know, there are, there are lessons. And I guess because I'm also a bit of a sentimentalist, I like to see that, you know, the spirit of the miners lives on in university lecturers, cleaners, you know, all, all the different groups we've seen taking action. That essence of the spirit is still there. Well, I'm here to take down the essence of the spirit a little bit because <laughs> you, you mentioned Lee Anderson and, and, and John, I'm going to quote you uh, here about Lee Anderson. I'm not a Lee Anderson correspondent. <laughs> no, no, no. <laughs> but you did, you did say when you were writing about, about the strike and about how you, you said it amounted to the dismantling of a whole social order's formation. Yeah. And you mentioned Lee Anderson. Did I? Yeah, and he, he, you know, he is someone who represents a constituency in the former Nottingham Coalfield. And yeah. you said his approach to politics is, quote, a twisted echo of the blunt confrontational spirit of 1984 to 85. Yeah, yeah. So, so yes. The word twisted but, is doing a lot of work. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, but, but, I mean, you're, you're suggesting a pretty bleak legacy, if that's the case. No, I'm, I don't think I am. Okay. Um, but Lee Anderson... God, do we have to talk about Lee Anderson? <laughs> <laughs> Lee Anderson presents himself. So this... I mean, I, met, I wrote this down when I was on the train this morning about this, about the... So this is some of, these are some of the more problematic legacies of... Not so much the strike, actually, but that whole shift from an, a broadly sort of industrialised economy into a post-industrial economy and what that does, right? Or certainly what it did in the case of the UK. And 
So, so there's, there are two things that I think are worth mentioning here, and Lee Anderson maybe shines light on both of them. <laughs> uh, one of them is to do with masculinity, actually. Because although, as we've said, the minor strike was sort of carried out, was prosecuted, if you like, by men and women, it was about jobs done by men, right? And although we don't live in a world or a country anywhere, anyway, where uh, they dig coal out the ground anymore, and in many ways that's a good thing, in, in all sorts of ways, you know, climate being the chief among them, but also the simple business of what mining is like, you know. It's not, it's not a very pleasant job at all, but it so happened, and this applies also to working in a steelworks or a shipyard, if you're a man, and a young man in particular, that's a pretty good job to have. It's an outlet for your physicality and your sense of who you are. Also, those jobs, unlike service sector jobs, they came with this narrative, broadly speaking, the dignity of labour. You know, there was a story about why they were worthwhile and important, um, which no one has even tried to apply to service jobs. I don't know whether you can, you know. <laughs> Our notion of service jobs is the office, the sitcom, right, you know. Well, those jobs are pointless and those people are ridiculous, you know, and even people who, who have those jobs, you know, are encouraged to think there's something sort of absurd about what they do. This is a huge sort of philosophical and cultural shift away from meaningful work, right? Uh, and I think that leaves men in particular with a sort of distant sense that they're not the people perhaps they want to be and they're not the people that their fathers and grandfathers and great-grandfathers were. And I don't think we talk about that enough as a society. I really, really don't. And I think that leaves space for people like Lee Anderson. It's very interesting that if you looked at polling figures for who supported a no-deal Brexit, you know they were completely out of whack gender-wise. It was a very male thing, the no-deal Brexit position, and women didn't like it at all, right? That tells you something about Brexit, bit, or that version of Brexit anyway, being a sort of outlet for that toxic masculinity. Take back control. That's one thing. <laughs> Take back control, you know. It's a very macho thing, Brexit, in its own way. Although I understand completely why people voted for it, incidentally, just to make that clear. You know. And if I lived in Stoke-on-Trent, I'd have voted Brexit as well, just to make that clear. <laughs> really, I mean that. Um, which brings me on to the second question. There's, there's this other question that was sort of whether the working class or the organised working class after the strike, right? And what happens, and this isn't unconnected to the strike, is it gets moved aside, right? Up to that point, reached its high point in the 70s, really, the high point of trade union power. The organised working class is at the centre of politics because it's placed itself there. That's its quest, right? It wants to be. It has to be at the centre of politics. And then after these serial defeats in the 80s and the deindustrialisation of the economy, the organised working class isn't there anymore. And the working class in a lot of uh, political commentary and the political discourse in Westminster and so on becomes something else. Particularly in these deindustrialised areas, it becomes an awkward and uneasy and sneered at sort of presence, right? A lot of people, even on the political left, it seems to me, would rather those places and those people didn't exist. In fact, after 2019, there were people who had been involved at the top of the Labour Party who said, well, let's have a new party that cuts its ties to these places. That doesn't have anything to do with the old coalfields and Stoke-on-Trent and wherever else, right? Mm. The northeast of England, Fife, you know, all the great working-class heartlands. So that's where you end up. And unfortunately, I think someone like Lee Anderson is a symptom of that. That that in that political vacuum, he presents himself entirely cynically, it's an affectation, as the authentic voice of the working class, as against the political left, right? And part of the reason for that, unfortunately, is the political left has allowed that to happen. That's why mm. I think. Um, OK, so I'm not going to ask about Lee Anderson. We've dealt with Lee Anderson. <laughs> <laughs> but I'd like he's... to come back to the toxic masculinity. Yes. Um... Because as an MP, I spent a lot of time helping constituents. That's what your job is. Um, and, a, and a very wise old bird told me my first and great bit of advice was, remember, Sean, we are not here to adjudicate. We are here to advocate. And it comes into those roles that women played as advocates. But what do you say to somebody who comes to see you and says, Sean, I work for your husband in X colliery. Oh, do you remember me on the picket line? Well, yes, of course I do. How are you? I think. And you're talking... You know, I went in, in to Westminster in 2005, which is probably 20 years after the strike, isn't that? And they have not worked in a proper job, or what would they would consider a proper job, uh, from that moment where they saw themselves as coal hewers, yeah, yeah. producers of coal. Um, 
with something to offer the community. And then they would apologetically tell you, you know, they'd say, oh, well, you know, my health, I got checked on the scrappy. And these, this, these are the terms that, that they used. Because that weight of, of political, you, you know, um, and that dash, does anybody remember the dash in the Labour Party for the number of graduates who were members? And we, we saw that move from being, you know, really proud of being working class people and ordinary people and doers and activists and, and, and community creators and what happened, changing under us. And it was very, very difficult to support those men in particular because their wives had had to go out and get jobs, get careers, support the household income. And it was very, very difficult at that point for those men to reconcile how their lives had changed. Yeah, yeah. And I also represented a constituency where we didn't have any pits left. They'd, they'd, they'd long gone in Swansea East. But what I did have was 11,500 civil servants. <laughs> you know, PCS was one of my most powerful unions. You, you know, and I'd regularly... <laughs> being lobbied and uh, uh, told where we were going wrong as a Labour Party and what we needed to do. But when you've got a huge entity like the DVLA, you will all have written to the DVLA or have a relationship with the DVLA at some point in your future, dependent upon your age. But the DVLA was a mega employer, five and a half thousand people when I came into, you know, in, 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 in as an MP. They had three massive locations across one's east you know, and they they did an awful lot of, you know they had a lot of skills but when you talked about outsourcing right mm. you're talking about how at this point the trade union becomes the focus you know people would bump along with their membership of the trade union and then the dreaded word outsourcing would come whap union membership would change overnight yeah. double overnight you know, the union would have me up there to talk to people. And I used to, always used to say to people, I can't tell you to go on strike because only you know what your family predicaments are and situations, how you can afford this. But I can tell you that, you know, collectively you will achieve more than if you worked individually. And, and they would get, and we would, be, we would beat off the government. We would beat off outsourcing. And we would do it by working collectively having a plan, you know, doing things jointly mm. with other civil servants and bringing people together. And I remember at this point, you would be talking to young families about why they wanted to vote Labour. I remember this young family telling me, well, why wouldn't I vote Labour, Sean? And I'd go, you tell me then. My kids go to excellent schools. I have a job. I have a job with dignity in the future. My wife's got a good job. We live in our own home. You know, and all those aspirational things that I grew up in in the 60s and the 70s, which were, were really the glittering prizes for us, well, weren't they really? You know, my parents fought hard to get, my, my parents-in-law fought hard to get on the property ladder, uh, to get us better educated, and I went and blew it all by getting married at 16, as far as my parents <laughs> were concerned. But, but, but there we are. But the whole thing was, when I talked to those young fans, they understood that value of being <coughs> Maybe they didn't realise it, how important it was, until it was there. You know, until the outsourcing challenge was there. But the union would swing in then, you know, We'd swing in as MPs behind it, uh, assembly members, local councillors, and, and, and collectively we would achieve these things. But the resonance of, of what John was saying there about how the men saw themselves. And I remember a, a government minister described, oh, see, Sean, it's called churn. It's got, called churn. When my dad started work, Martin's father started work as 14-year-olds underground. Yeah, yeah. Their aim was to get a gut, you know, was to get that miner's lamp, wasn't it? And, and, and the years of pension under their belt. No one is going to work in a job like that today where they get the gold watch after 43 years. They may have had eight different careers in that time. 
And how do we prepare working class communities for that? How do we prepare uh, collectively trade unions, so, you, know, you know, socialists, uh, uh, Labour Party members? How do we... And the saddest thing I ever read as a Member of Parliament was some research that, that um, Bernardo's had done in schools in my constituency. What is the biggest worry of eight-year-olds in Swansea East at that time? Not getting a job. Eight-year-olds. I can't even remember a date if I even thought about what a job was. But when you've got children as young as that, thinking about what is ahead of me. You know, that is the perfect time to talk to people about what collectivism does, what working together does, what solidarity can achieve, what being in, in, in a campaign, a planned campaign can do. So I saw it from all sides, really. But the saddest things were, were those men who had lost their ways, who no point of, you know, no blame of their own, and they felt that it was, we got thrown on the scrap sure. heap. Sean, I'm going to stop you there. Thank you. Um, and I think we, we've now got time to uh, open up the discussion. Uh, questions from the audience. Um, so if you put your hands up, we'll get the microphone to you. I'd like to ask, though, I, I mean, I... I think there are some people in the audience who are from uh, mining communities, and I'd like, if possible, the first question to come from someone who uh, comes from a mining community. Um, so if, oh. if you could put your hands up, we'll get one. the... Let Got me just... See. I now need to change my, change my glasses. But there was a, there's, a, there's someone with the hands up. And there's somebody with... Who is... Uh, right, so yeah, there. you've got the microphone. So you first. Thank you. Um, you're going to find this awkward because I was born and brought up in a mining village in Nottinghamshire, at Warsop. But from 1982 to 85, I was working in HM Treasury as the desk officer for coal and electricity during the strike. So um, the question I'd like to get on to, really, is, is when you have this sort of enormous upheaval at the end of the strike, how, how do you get dialogue with the government about how you move forward from there? I mean, pretty well every scheme that came anywhere near me, I proved the most generous severance scheme ever in the public sector. The, pers the person in the Treasury who controlled public sectors, she said this is the most you know, generous thing we've ever done for anybody was for the miners, and the Treasury Minister signed it off. We had a scheme to start businesses, which we put money into and lost a whole lot of it. We invested in a new mine at Astrid B in Leicestershire, Leicestershire which had a dodgy geology and finally failed. So... But there was nobody to talk to, if you sort of mean. And nobody came our way saying, we've got this horrendous social problem in this area. Could we do this scheme? And, and that's a bit of dialogue, which is probably at least half our fault. Um, but it, 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 it's a question that lingers over me, is how do you pick up a community and take them forward? Mm. And don't think the miners were alone in this. And one of the things that just needs to be said is that the high price of electricity, which was driven by the inability to, coal, to close coal mines, put other, bit, uh, put other people out of jobs. The aluminium industry is a very good example of that. Up in, North, up in North Wales yeah. and up in Northumberland, I've just been up there to see that. They closed because we were uncompetitive on, 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 on energy prices. So I'd just like to sort of de-simplify the, you know, throw a few difficult points into the conversation, but I'd like to get back to the, when you have a social disaster somewhere, how do you talk to government? And who are the people who are going to sort of make a bridge which would allow something constructive to be done next? Um, I, thank, miss, thank I missed you. the first bit of that. What, what years were you working on, on, on the desk? 82 to 85. 82 to 85, right. So right through the strike. This is when we got the, down, you know, the downgrading of coal in Europe. You know, we're reducing coal production in Europe. You can buy a tonne of cheap coal from the USSR on the docks in Barry for 10 quid. Well, it was from we Australia, produce, actually. We could not produce coal in Britain right. exactly. at that price. That's we couldn't. Right. Exactly. So we were on an unlevel playing field from day one. We were at a disadvantage. What were our negotiators talking about out in Europe? 
They, they weren't talking about a viable coal industry. They were talking about downgrading. We, we visited the Blenny mine in, in Belgium last year, and we met a Belgian ex-miner, and he said the only people who fought back against the downgrading of coal in Europe were the Belgians and the British. All the rest just capitulated. When did the last miner uh, cease to be employed in Germany? Nin 2018. Because what they did at the end of their mining industry, so I would question the generosity of, of the severance and the pensions, okay? 2018. They calculated how long was they, how old was their youngest miner? How many more years would he really want to work for? Wanted to work, work until he was 55, he was 20 at the, you know, in the 80s. And that's when they had their massive severance pays. They are known as little princes because they got such good severance packages, you know, the deep mine is in, in Germany. So what we could see from our point of view was there was no negotiation, there was no representation. We weren't hearing about a government that was talking about a viable industry. Right? We were hearing about a government that wanted to downgrade us and they cut after cut. They made an announcement that they were going to uh, invest £15 million on a new face in my husband's colliery. You think, bloody hell, we've made it, haven't we? £15 million investment, new face, more coal, anthracite, highest quality, highest grade anthracite. You went, we all went, oh dear because that was £15 million pound of debt on the colliery. We couldn't meet the debt already on the colliery, you know, because the collieries had to pay their own way. So another £15 million pound of debt. We couldn't produce, the men couldn't produce. The so what do we have? Well, you know, sorry, you're not economically viable. So I think it was a two-way thing. There was a huge mistrust on our side, as to what our government was doing and how it was representing the coal industry in this big negotiation about the downgrading of coal and how we couldn't rely on coal any longer and the, and the effect on the environment. Have a chat with Greece about that. Have a chat about, you know, to Poland about this. Have a chat to the USSR about it. You know, they, they're not concerned about the environment, but we knew we had to be responsible. So I think the, another legacy of the strike was the suspicion of how our government was representing us on this big playing field, on this big change of attitude. We couldn't go on forever. We knew that, but we weren't confident that we had an energy policy that would help sustain us slowly into closure. Francis, can I, can I ask you to respond as well to that question? Yeah, I mean, I, I think there could have been negotiation on the definition of uneconomic. Yeah. And you'll recall that the NUM commissioned Andrew Glynn, yeah. I think it was, who, um, uh, well, I, and I think history will show that the coal board's figures uh, were, shall we say, dodgy. Um, and that uh, okay. on top of that, there was this scope to identify, well, let's have a discussion about how long the life of any given pit should be. Secondly, I think what was different with Thatcher compared to any other country I can think of was the complete absence of any social plan. There was nothing. There was nothing. Um, and, uh, you know, the way in which families and communities, in fact, were punished through the strike, which is something else I remembered, the benefits yeah. being cut. You know, this, this, was, this was not about easing people through a transition. This felt, I have to say, at the time, like cold-blooded punishment. Um, but, and actually, the coal industry is not the only area where it felt like the dialogue wasn't there. Again, my, my dad worked at Cowley. The car industry in the late 70s came up with, um, through the Institute for Workers' Control, came up with um, an incredible, far-sighted 
uh, environmentally aware plan for the car industry to develop hybrid cars. It was already happening in Japan. Um, we could have been a leader, but the government uh, and the employers did not listen. So it's not the first time that workers have come up with uh, thought through, carefully researched, indiv independently evaluated alternatives, but they are not listened to. Now, my question is, we've got to do it different this time. I mean, actually, if the closures hadn't been so brutal in the 80s, I kind of think the UK could have been um, a leader on clean coal technology, which the world desperately needs. Whether or not we have a coal industry, it's out there in the world, and actually those technologies could have been developed. got a bottle of water in their pocket. Yeah. Anybody got a bottle of water? Yeah. Every bottle of water produced is filtrated over anthracite. But it, again, we have an opportunity uh, with climate change, with the uh, sp rapid spread of artificial intelligence. Unions in the TUC are coming up with plans for what we call a just transition. And there are models out there in the world, including conversations that have been had between the trade union movement and trade unions in Spain, in Germany, in America, where there are real plans for how you can do this in a way that protects people's livelihoods, reskills, upskills, uh, keeps communities alive. So sometimes it's about having two willing partners and a preparedness to listen because workers do have good ideas and you know that could be really positive for the whole country. Thank you. We've, we've only got about four minutes or so left and I know there was someone else at the, right at the back with the blue um, uh, thank you. Do you want to ask a question? And I'm going to ask uh, for very quick responses so we can maybe squeeze in one more question. Thank you. So you can hear me okay? Oh, thank you. Thank you. Uh, so my name is Jim McMahon. I'm uh, still a proud miner. Oh, it's in my blood and it will never ever leave me. Uh, I'm honoured to be here today to take part in this debate uh, because I walked through those gates below that banner and the 5th of March, 1985, maybe with a tear in my eye, knowing I'd lost the battle, but my head was held high, knowing that I had given absolutely everything for that fight. And I was only a young man at 23 years old, with a year old kid, but I knew the impact. Uh, I'm a deputy leader of a council, and I delivered a motion to the council last week. It's probably one of the most emotional uh, motions that's ever been delivered. It's in East Ayrshire Council. I come to Cumnock, which was the home of Keir Hardy. So, the, the going out and strike w was obviously a, a, a massive decision for us, and I think one of the things we need to recognise that the strike was legal in Scotland because after the back of the pithead ballots, then the subsequent uh, conveners meetings, then it was made legal. We had a ballot in Scotland, and it's something that should never be remissed. There's many things uh, I represent, a ward where we had one village, and I'll name it, it's New Cumnock, who was a proud, proud community, its foundations were coal. It was built on coal, it had a population of 7,000, and now has a population of 2,800. We lost in the region of 6,000 jobs, and it was that knock-on effect that was mentioned for one job in the mines we lose for everywhere else. So. I know, I'm conscious that there are people wanting to ask questions, but Sean, I think it was yourself that spoke about working class communities. Right? And I was asked the question when I was elected uh, in 2022, how come we've got a conservative member in our communities now? My only answer could be that we've moved on two generations, I think, from the minor strike and times have passed and people seem to forget. I will never forget, but to define a working class community now is difficult when we saw what happened in England in the last elections with the Red Wall and it moved. So how do we define a working class community? Well, uh, uh, so if you could answer that in one minute and seven seconds. <laughs> if you've got to work to earn your money and you haven't got a private trust account, you're working class. <laughs> That's the definition. They can call themselves middle class, they can call themselves up the middle class or blue collar. Fact is, if you're dependent on that wage packet coming in every week or every month or whatever, you're working class. 
Thank you. Uh, John, Robert, do you want to kind of add to... What, that uh, question of how you recognise a working class? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know when you see them. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's one way of answering it. The other, I mean, the other thing is that there's a, this question about what happened when, when the so-called Red Wall... <laughs> Much You've got 30 spread. seconds, by suddenly the way. Voting, suddenly started voting Conservative. There were profound reasons for that. Yeah. The, the Labour vote had declined over years in a lot of those places. Uh, it was to do with a very, very long process of, of estrangement. And I think one of the interesting things about, this, about looking back at this period from the vantage point of now is that so many things have changed, and yet because we've got this peculiar electoral system, we've still got these two parties, the same two parties as we had in the 40s and the 50s and the 60s and the 70s, are still sitting there as if they're somehow the same things that represent the same people, right? And they're not. Everything has changed. And I await, really, I think that you said we, the minor strike ushered us you know, in a very brutal way into this new world. I think we're still waiting for a politics which suits that new world, right? Yeah. A new left politics, to be honest, that suits that new world. And, and we await it still. Thank you. Sir. Thank you. Uh, I'm, I'm so sorry. I know there were other people who wanted to ask a question. I'm so sorry, but we have run out of time. Um, it's just... It remains for me to urge you to buy Robert's buy book. book. <laughs> it's absolutely uh, magnificent. It really is. And you'd be crazy to leave here empty-handed. He'll be signing copies in the foyer. Um, let me finish by thanking you for coming. Uh, and perhaps we can all thank the panel for their discussion this evening. Thank you. Thank you, thank you David. And a final word for me, thank you so much, everyone, for such a brilliant and insightful evening. And um, please do go and um, purchase a copy of the book and get a wonderful signature. Um, thank you also to those of people who have attended online and have joined us online. Thank you very much indeed. Um, and once you've got your lovely signed copy of your book, um, please enjoy the rest of your evening and leave the library via Gate 5. Thank you very much for coming, everyone. Thank you.